first uh, Lunch and Learn series, and uh, we had said the last time, it was the last uh, call, but this uh, talk was really a gift for us. Um, some of you know that uh, we have the funding through HRSA, um, uh, which is a sister agency for NIH, uh, in, needed for, um, or the funding is used for identifying gaps in genetic services. So this is uh, one of the activities we had started with great success, and the reason it's taken a little bit long with technology is because there are other sites which are connecting through here who will be watching this. And we are also taping this to be available to fellows and for teaching purposes um, on our website at uh, SERP New One Screening. <coughs> so it was a team effort, and I feel very fortunate uh, to have um, somebody like Dr. Burma's work I have admired for many, many years and the efforts he had made to introduce genetics in India and the, and the leadership role he has demonstrated. And Madhuri was very helpful in getting all this organized, so I'm going to let her have the privilege of introducing a very strong man who we all admire. Um, it is my pleasure and really honor to introduce Dr. Verma. Anyone who has done genetics in India, uh, knows Dr. Varma. I personally grew up with looking at him as the guy for genetics and you know my interest in genetics developed from there. So just as an introduction, he has a very long CV but I put something together. Uh, Dr. Varma is currently the director of Center of Medical Genetics at uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital in Delhi. And this center actually offers the most comprehensive genetic counseling and testing program for uh, biochemical, molecular and cytogenetics. He was earlier the professor of uh, pediatrics and genetics at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. Uh, he trained in genetics at the Mass General Hospital in Boston, the Deafness Institute at NIH, uh, Willing Lab in Manchester, Guy's Hospital, London, uh, Weatherall uh, Institute for Molecular Medicine at Oxford, and in the Department of Genetics at Zurich, Switzerland. He is a fellow of Royal College of Physicians, London American Academy of uh, Pediatrics, National Academy of uh, Medical Sciences in India, and Indian Academy of Pediatrics. He, has, he is currently the president of the Indian Society of Inborn Errors of Metabolism and the Society of Fetal Medicine. He has also had a new, numerous awards, um, some of them being the Rambaxi Science Award, the Indian Council of Medical Research Award, National Academy of Medical Sciences Award and the BC Roy Medical Council of India Award. <coughs> he is the advisor, he has been the advisor for WHO Geneva for the past two decades and also the regional uh, office of WHO in Southeast Asia. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Verma to give his talk. Well, friends and colleagues, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here. And I want to begin by thanking uh, Dr. Madhuri Hegde and Dr. Uh, Rani Singh for giving me this opportunity to come and share some of the exciting world of genetics in India. So I'd like to start with this, uh, this voyage uh, with this ship, which uh, is one of the most, uh, or in fact the most famous ship in medical history. That is HMS Beagle in 1838 when Darwin set uh, around the world and then uh, postulated is uh, the greatest uh, thought in the world, the evolution based on the changes in DNA. So India, friends, is a land of contrast. So on the one hand, you have the bullock carts and on the other hand, you have these uh, vehicles going to space. So we sent a vehicle to the moon and in fact, it brought the first evidence that there is uh, water on the moon. In genetics, I remember uh, the OS Reddy was one of the very early geneticists in India. He set up the first <coughs> institute of genetics. And in 1968, I remember uh, he wrote that uh, in India, there are only humans and no genetics. But I think we've changed, uh, gone, uh, come up a long way. And uh, last year, we started a National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, uh, which in fact is taking part in the International Cancer Genome Project. I think they are. Uh, doing next generation sequencing of oral cancer. So this is a news item from the Hindu, one of the prominent Indian newspapers in January this year. So uh, WHO removed India from the list of polio endemic countries as no case of polio has been reported since January 2011. 
and Bill Gates of course praised India for this because only three years ago, India had more polio cases than any other country in the world. So I think this has sort of demonstrated the will that if the will is there, we can do it in India. So contrary to popular belief, genetic disorders are actually more common in India than in Western countries. Because people used to think, oh, developing countries, there are no genetic disorders. So of course, the, what has happened recently is that infant mortality has come down and uh, the uh, better ICU facilities. So these infants with metabolic disease, with genetic disorder, they are surviving. Earlier they used to die. And uh, so then we have a, a greater marriage, consanguineous marriages. So what you, you find in India, of course, we are not as, uh, we are not as uh, the frequency of frequency of consanguineous marriage, not as much as the Middle East. But still in South India, there are 30% of people but preferentially marry consanguinously. While the Muslims in India, India is the second largest Muslim country in the world, and the Muslims all over India, the, uh, the frequency of consanguinous marriages is almost like the Middle East. Then there is also the uh, hemoglobin approaches in India. So, so again, you will find India that very, uh, the, uh, the frequency of uh, birth with hemoglobin disorders is something like one in 2,000 births. So it's still one of the very high ones. So based on these factors, because the, the incidence of genetic disorder is high. And if I show you the burden, okay. So the burden of genetic disease in India is a large population, 27 million births per year. It's a huge number. So you find the congenital malformations, almost one in 50, 678,000. Down syndrome, 34,000 cases of Down syndrome born every year. Metabolic disorders, 22,000 cases of metabolic disorders. Beta thalassemia, 16,000. Congenital hypothyroidism, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So you find all these disorders occur there. And the total frequency is really very high. The largest number of factor infants per year with genetic disorders in the world. So the Human Genome Project, I think, changed the attitude towards genetic disorders. The government woke up. And in the initial Human Genome Project, they didn't take much interest. But I think then, gradually, uh, the, now they have, the realization has come that this has much to offer us. And uh, so the immediate benefit of the Genome Project came in the diagnostics. Identifying the new genes and the GMO studies, and uh, leading on to molecular tests and the genetic screening and prevention of disease. And uh, I think this is getting stuck again. Why is it getting stuck? Okay, this is better. So, right, you get this here. So, uh, in therapeutics, of course, we are still at the level of research and uh, pharmacogenomics. The personalized medicine. But I think still it's a matter of the future. We have set up a number of uh, pharmacogenomic tests, but the physician hardly use them. I think to change the practice of physician is not easy. Because they are not uh, used to uh, prescribing drugs, and now that uh, you say, okay, do this genetic test before you prescribe the drug. So it's very difficult to change that practice. Okay. So, <coughs> so basically to tackle this whole burden, uh, we have to, uh, I think, uh, genetic counseling is the key. And this is a sort of pattern that we see in our own center. And we find that uh, the 40% uh, of our work is concerned with prenatal diagnosis because no one wants to have an affected child. If they have an affected child, then they're always very concerned that the next child should be normal. And even generally during pregnancy, they are willing to undergo any test to make sure the baby is not affected. Then of course the uh, single gene disorders, the diagnosis and the prenatal diagnosis, because of the molecular revolution, 
So this number is increasing over the years. So from 3.1%, now it's almost 15% of our patients that we see with the, who guide them about this uh, single gene disorder, mental retardation, chromosomal disorders, hemophilia. So what you find in India, of course, we have the wide variety of disorders. So the, the, the counselor has to know about so many disorders. It's much wider than many other countries because here, of course, there are few geneticists. So that you really have to know and widen your interest. So in genetic, the, the, the classic definition of genetic counseling has been that assists the uh, affected individual to understand the nature of the disorder, the prognosis, inheritance. But I think in India now there is an additionally important task that we have to establish the diagnosis and we have to advise about treatment. Traditionally, I remember when I used to train in Boston, we hardly ever gave any advice about treatment. We were interested in risk of recurrences and calculation, but now it's all here. That when the patient comes to us, no specific diagnosis has been made. They say, oh, it's a mucopolysaccharidosis. But what is the type that has not been established? Mental retardation, many cases come. So the, and the many come when the mother is already pregnant. They say, okay, I had a child who has mental retardation, and she is pregnant, and then she comes to us. To, okay, so we first establish the diagnosis in the affected child. So here's a typical consultation. So this family, the uh, died at age of four months. So this couple came to me. This uh, yeah, their son had died at age four months. Diarrhea, fever, urinary tract infection, liver disease, hepatitis. So I was scratching my head what it might be. So then she told me. On questioning that she also, this child had severe thrush and the she, maternal uncles also had died from thrush and infection. So this changed the whole picture. So I could now hear, look here it is, it's an excellent disease and we uh, suspected that this would be uh, the uh, excellent form of scale and we were able to study this gene and carry out the molecular test, find out the mutation. So we helped to her to have a normal child in the next pregnancy. We tested her system, and she also turned out to be a carrier. And so we were able to help her also to have a normal child. So in India, when the patient comes for counseling, he's not only the, the, the parents and the child. The whole family will come. They, they, so, this, uh, uh, so this man came with his parents, and this girl came with her parents. And what the, this she had a brother who was blind and had mental retardation. So they told me, okay, what might be the risk to her child? So I said, okay, you bring this child and let me have a look. He was now adult, about 25 years, and you bring him and I'll see uh, if I can help. But when he came, the eyes were almost the eyeballs were for, for totally destroyed, and uh, really I was being stuck. So what I might do? And then after they had gone back, the her parents came back to me and said, Doctor, we did not tell you the whole story. Because her, this mother also had a sister who had a similarly affected child, son. Again, this changed the picture. So, in when I'm training, you see, Mass General, I think might be there was somebody there who had first described Norris disease. So I had Norris disease in mind. So we were able to carry out mutation studies in him and then found that he, fortunately, she was not a carrier. And uh, so there you are. So this is how in India we have to be very careful because the, the whole families will come. They'll come in, in laws and this. So what we tell them? So one thing we have to try to avoid blame anybody because they always they always they are saying okay your side of the family has brought the disease and your side of the family has brought the disease. So we have to uh, sort of we had to tread a sort of middle path. And um, and the words we say can be very helpful to them, in soothing, and you know, they come very disturbed. So that way I think the counseling is, we have to be very careful about words. In fact, recently I, the strength of words, uh, I came to realize, that I, I get an annual from a school uh, principal, because uh, I treated him as a child once. So there was an article there, that uh, there was a blind man sitting there with a board, and he had a board there saying, I'm blind, please help. And nobody was really putting any money. So one girl came along and she inverted the board and wrote something. So people started putting money. So at the end of the day, this man wondered, what had this girl written on the board? 
And what she had written was, it's a fine day, you can see it, I can't. And that changed the whole picture. So I think the words we use in counseling are really very important to help these families. So diagnosed by report control. So here is a family in Lahore. See, in Pakistan is full of genetic disease because of the high consanguinities. And there the services in genetics are even poorer than in India. So this couple from Lahore contacted us. They had lost one child and with progressive encephalopathy. And this child was down low. And then this uh, girl, seizures at three months, difficult to treat, ammonia levels were high, no acidosis or hypoglycemia. But he had alopecia and there was a rash. So that gave us a clue what the diagnosis might be. So this was completely sort of bald uh, head, uh, he had developed hardly any hair. So we suspected uh, that this is a deficiency. And we uh, get, collected, get, they sent us filter paper on the, they sent us urine and blood on the filter paper. We were able to do an MSMS study and showed increase in the C5. And there's a multiple cause of deficiency. And uh, we then uh, sequenced the gene and we found the mutation for them. And then they did a CVS in Lahore and uh, sent us the DNA and we found the fetus was affected. But then the pregnancy had advanced too much. So fortunately this is a disease which is treatable. And if you treat them right from birth, they would be completely normal. And that's what happened. So they treated this child from birth and the child is growing normally. <coughs> but recently, about two weeks ago, they, the man contacted us again that uh, the wife is pregnant again. And he still wanted a prenatal. Because still to have someone who doesn't need treatment would be preferable. So here we are now carrying one prenatal for his current pregnancy. So there are, we have to become, I think most of our training in India is a lot of clinical training. Of course there are less facilities for this, laboratory tests, all they are there and all the big hospitals. But still, we have to sharpen our clinical equipment. I think greater, we use our clinical equipment much greater than many other countries where the, there is a more reliance on the laboratory test. So here this boy was sent to us, mother was pregnant, this boy was mental retardation, poor safety, depressed nasal breath, short neck, middle flaring eyebrows, poorly inserted tender reflexes. But he also had this same rash. They had done tests for MPS and found it to be negative. So this gave us the clue that it might be it's multiple sulfatase deficiency. Because they have features of MPS, the core system, they have the poorly inserted flexes, which is the MLD, and the ichthyosis. So this was the diagnosis. So in this we went on to do the enzymes, and we found all the enzymes, uh, all the sulfatases, the three, we tested three, they were all low, and uh, which confirmed our diagnosis. And we were able to sequence the gene and uh, show the mutation. And uh, unfortunately, by the time we found the mutation, and then the, uh, the family didn't come back for the prenatal. So here's another two-year-old boy, again from Pakistan, consanguineous marriage, floppy at three months, no head control at six months, seizures at seven months, at 18 to 20 months, in each inability to sit, stand, or turning, and at two years was bedridden. Generalized spasticity with brisk reflexes, head size of 55. History of similar illness in a child in a distant relative, which had been diagnosed in England as Alexander disease. But we asked them to send us the MRIs. So MRIs are of course very useful in all these children with neurodegenerative problems. And we, this uh, will give you a lot of clues. So we here were able to make the diagnosis from the MRI because the disease uh, here in the thalamus, the globus pilus and thalamus were involved while the uh, putamen and they were spared. And uh, so here, and then of course there's a leukodystrophy, so we made a diagnosis of Canavan disease. So we did the GCMS and showed increase the acetyl aspartate and the ML was done, and uh, we again the, find the mutation. And uh, so we were then in that way, we, uh, uh, so we have two more families of Canavan disease in India and which we were able to do uh, mutation studies and uh, help these families. 
No, this one disease, which is a common in India than anywhere else in the world, this we call the megalocephalic leukodystrophy, which is mild course and named after Vanderknapp. Vander this was first described by actually Dr. Singhal from Bombay, in Bombay Hospital. But it was not named after Vanderknapp. She was more famous, and which is a phenomenon, of course, not uncommon in medicine. That somebody else first described and gets named after some other person. So here is the feature. They come with large heads and they have some developmental day. They, may, they often get seizures by one to two years. And then after three, four years, they may have neuroregulation. But many have a very mild course. They go to school, about 50% go to school. And some are even professionals. But the MRIs, of course, are characteristic. So you will find there is a dismyelination throughout. And you find the gyro, they become very wide. And if you do the 2T uh, and the, uh, the MRI, you find this uh, uh, white pattern changes all over intensity. And this of course, there are cysts in the frontal lobes as well as the temporal lobes. So these are characteristics. So here, this gene exon, men see one gene at 12 exons. So in the this uh, most of the Indian patients which occur in Agarwals, they, they have one mutation called the C135. This is the insertion of C at codon 135. And uh, so we have 105 cases we have studied, 43 with homozygous mutation. The, all the non agarwals have a different mutation. But when this occurs in both. And it's often described all over the world from Turkey and other countries. So in the non agarwal the mutations are different. But in the other walls, this is Mukshet, and we think this is a founder mutation in the other walls. So these are the genetics of um, MLC1, about 75%. And the new gene, as we recently been uh, described, HEPACAM gene, and which is about 20% of these. And interestingly, this gene, if you occur by mutation, they will give you like a classical megalocephaly. But if it's only one allele is changed, then it may give you microcephaly, which improves. <coughs> or it is also associated with mental retardation and autism. So we are now ourselves doing a study in the carriers of this gene, uh, whether they are showing any psychiatric changes. Dr. Brahmachari had described about a few years earlier that this gene was involved in schizophrenia. So the other walls are very interesting community that uh, they, uh, they origin in North India, this uh, in, uh, in this state called Haryana, and almost 5,000 years ago. And this king had, uh, uh, you know, he had about 17 children, and they had 17 sects. Yeah, these are these among other walls. So all the mythal, the rich mythals, and uh, billionaires. So they are very acute, the sharp businessmen. And they have spread all over the world. But they, I think something like the Jews, they have a number of mutations which are uh, uh, sort of they, they occur more commonly in the other wall. For example, they have a spinal cerebral ataxia. And in all other walls, it's usually their SCA12. They have a levitus patch disease and a common mutation called the insertion of uh, A in, uh, at 215 codon. And they have hereditary factors, but we have had two family, two children with other wall, and they all have the same, both have the same mutation. So I think these five six diseases we think are founder mutations for this community. And we are developing a sort of panel like the your Oscar Jews use panel to screen these uh, <coughs> community. So here's another child. This child was uh, retarded and the mother was pregnant, and the history was that the uh, child had uh, Delayed milestones, no seizures, severe hypertonia, and increased deep tendon reflexes. <coughs> he had been in, intensively investigated. SMA, there was no deletion, EMGs were done, muscle biopsies, keratides, fragile leg screening, array circuitry were all normal. But here we got the clue again for the MRI. So the MRI showed again that the uh, thalamus and the globus pedals were involved while the putomen were spare. And you look here, in this view, you will find these uh, empty spaces. These are due to the cerebral edema and the increase of the perivascular spaces. 
And then, of course, if you look here, the white matter changes, they are sort of linear pattern. So these are classical for MSUD. So we made a diagnosis of MSUD, and uh, we uh, were uh, uh, able to make a prenatal diagnosis and help this child. So this child really has done very well on giving him an MSUD diet, although started at the age of four years. So probably he had a milder mutation to begin with, because many of them would die in neurological period. Like here he survived, but at four years he was of course retarded, so the parents were very happy with the, the therapy. So then of course we concerned. The chromosomal disorders, just moving on to chromosomal disorders. So these chromosomal disorders, uh, there are many laboratories in India doing the chromosomal disorders. And traditionally, these people started doing chromosomal disorders in the departments of anatomy in the medical schools. So we have done, ourselves do a lot of 15,000 uh, chromosomal various developmental delay and amenorrhea's, recurrent miscarriages, <coughs> and then of course the amniotic fluid we've done about 7,000 and uh, the micro deletion. So in the in the U.S. and in the, even the Europe, uh, people are saying that okay, if you have a child, a small fixed child. Go ahead and do a microarray, and you know, microarrays are seem to be sort of replacing the regular cytogenetic. But I think in our country, because of cost, we still I think I have to do first the chromosomal study, because the chromosomal study the cost is much less. While chromosomal study may cost you sixty dollars, while the microarray will cost you almost uh, let's say three hundred dollars. So this is still here. For example, we were able to detect on the uh, even on the cytogenetic study that this child had an extra material on chromosome 1 and the father was the carrier with the deletion from 11 and uh, going on to chromosome 1. But for publication, the uh, journal asked us that we must do a microarray. We did a fish study then to demonstrate this and we also did a microarray to confirm. So in India now microarrays also come in. So in this conflict children, but still most of us uh, do first a chromosomal study. And if it's negative, then we go on to do a microarray study. As far as screening for chromosomal disease, because I showed you that there's a large number of births with chromosomal disease. So we are following the policy that we should shift the screening to the first trimester, rather than doing the triple test in the second trimester. We still do a lot of triple test and quadruple test, but the first trimester, the accuracies are greater, and is easier. Even if you just only do the nuclear translucency, it's easier to get in India an ultrasound study. It's cheap, easy. Of course, we have to train the people to record it correctly. But even nuclear translucency alone picks pick up a rate of Down syndrome of 72.9%. So while your triple tests uh, are only 77%, and the quadruple is uh, 72. And they see the uh, say So here you find. So this, if you do nuclear translucency with the PABI and free beta HCG, the accuracy goes up to almost 90%. So we sort of advocating everywhere that go on to do the first trimester test. So we did a study in our own hospital. We followed what's called contingent screening. So in the first trimester, we did an NT and a HCG and PABI and divided the people into three groups. You had the high risk group, more than 150, we went ahead and did a coronary villus sampling. Those who were in the intermediate range, 1 in 50 to 1 in 1500, they were about 10%. Here there was only 1%. So this 10% we went and did a second trimester screening. And those who are negative again, we didn't do anything. But if those who came positive, we did have the And the low risk group, we didn't do anything. No further testing. And in fact, at the end, of, then we followed on these people right up to birth. And we found all the screen negative, really, uh, all fetuses are normal. And all the screen positive. So we really, by this technique, we picked up all those who were abnormal. So we think this is a good way to go about in India. Obviously, we were fortunate not to miss any, but uh, we can miss some, always, you know. So this is a possible model for poor resource countries. And the ultrasound really, as I said, is easier. The more, ultrasound is more easily available uh, than the uh, genetic test because the biochemical assays are more expensive. So here we then the, it has been uh, suggested that why do in the amniotic fluid do only five chromosomes 
do fish study for aneuploidy for five chromosomes, or do a pure PCR for five chromosomes, and don't need to do the whole full chromosomes. So we examined this in our own series, and we found out of the 7,287, when we did both karyotypes and fish, we found, of course, 86, 96% uh, were normal born both the techniques. But there are 249 were abnormal, and out of these, all the numerical of the common chromosomes, the five chromosomes, were picked up by fish, as well as by the uh, cytogenetics. But these structural abnormalities, balanced and the structural unbalanced, they were not picked up by the fish. So you miss out. So that really, you, I think in the US still, the tendency is to do culture in every case. But in Europe, I think mostly culture is done only in selected cases because the state is paying. In England, the state pays. So they have cut down the cost by only doing fish. Obviously, if there is a ultrasound abnormality, you would still do the culture. Or if there's a, what we ourselves do, if there's a family history of mental retardation, if there's a family history of abortions, and if the ultrasound shows abnormality, then we will do advice, culture, along with the fish study or the pure PCR. But if it's a maternal age, advanced maternal age, and all these other things are normal, we just might do this because to save the cost. So biochemical uh, technology has changed. So I think with this uh, TMS, the gas chromatography, all these now are becoming available, have become available in a number of laboratories in India. And so here was a case were diagnosed as uh, a genosuccinase urea. And with treatment, uh, he did well. He improved a lot, uh, but certainly, uh, since the diagnosis established late, he ended up with some mental tradition. So that, of course, is the need to do. Uh, so here, uh, we uh, do prenatal diagnosis. Many of the so the common in about the metabolism, maybe you can get an idea from here. The urea cycle disorders are common. MSU2 is common. The acidemia are common. Tyrosine electrosemia is common. TKU is not so common. And, the, and there's some of the other disorders. So the lysosomal disorders, of course, common, and you find the MTS as a group is very common. The largest number we did prenatal, and Gaucher disease and MLDs are common, and I think the GM1 ganglucidosis. So we find that they're doing prenatal diagnosis on the enzyme assays. Uh, we have found this uh, somewhat unreliable <coughs> because the overlap between the normal and the carriers and the carriers and the affected. So we uh, really, the gold standard is the molecular. So we've set up molecular tests for a large number of these inborn adult metabolism, which we commonly uh, come across in India. And we perhaps, uh, our next step is to do a next generation sequencing for these genes and to put them all together. So the newborn screen in India there was a study carried out in Bangalore, a pilot study, uh, which they screened 100,000 newborns. And they did what amino acids. And they found four amino acid disorders were common. But then there was no interest. But in the last few years, as the infant mortality has come down, there has been a renewed interest. And about uh, three years ago, the Indian Council of Medical Research uh, funded a study to study 100,000 newborns in uh, different states of India. So six centers were selected. And they have just completed the studies. And uh, the, uh, the results were that congestion hypothyroidism was about 1 into 2,500. So which is somewhat more that you will find in the West. There is a bit of ID deficiency in India. So that, I think, increases the frequency of this congestion hypothyroidism. And the CAH also is uh, more common. And uh, so what happens is our number of states, the small states, they have started mandatory screening. And then, of course, some parallel projects have started in Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra. And the most private hospitals are offering the new mouth screening, but at cost. So they charge some money, which is subsidized. And the TMS is available in many centers. <coughs> so the metabolic screening are taking off now because these are treatable. So that's the advantage. It's very easy to sell to diagnose treatable disorders. When the genetics, what has held back genetics in India, is that people have an impression now, they're not treatable. Of course, the burden on the people is there. And though they fail to realize, some of the politicians, that if you have a child with a genetic disease, how tough it is for the family. So they need counseling and they need the advice. 
<coughs> so the treatment, of course, the special diets now, and many of these companies, uh, we could always get these on a case basis. <coughs> but uh, the companies also have now started getting interested and in trying to make some local depots to uh, get the special. And the Genzyme company, fortunately, they started a compassionate program in India uh, where they are giving free treatment. <coughs> the enzymes are so expensive. In your country, you are lucky that the insurance companies cover this. The insurance companies in India will not repay anything which for a disease which is congenital, which means all genetic disorders. So I've been not sort of moving around trying to find ways how to influence and change the, in the, the insurance policies so that at least the genetic disease get covered. And uh, so, uh, the, so now, interestingly, of course, you have getting the trials for exome skipping and fragile X and SMA. But unfortunately, again, these companies, the, the, we had a lot of inquiries from the companies here, that, okay, we want to start fragile X, you know, the, to test the drug. But eventually, they somehow uh, don't uh, exclude us. But I think there is a big need, because there are a lot of patients are there with fragile X, with uh, the, uh, the SMA and all these, which can be the DMD, there's plenty of cases. And we sort of classified them off, how many other exons are deleted and whatnot. So uh, hopefully when this treatment comes, it will be very useful for our country. So the molecular diagnosis, I think, all over the world, as you know, Madhuri is here, and she has set up this fantastic lab, which offers such a large number of tests. But uh, we, again, see the thalassemia is our commonest disorder. Duchenne was food history, the next one we do, fragile X, spinal muscle atrophy, cystic fibrosis also is there in India. And uh, we find that the delta 508 is about 40 to 50 percent. And the rest of the mutations are different from the panel that you have here. So this panel is very not useful in our country. Only useful, of course, is the delta 508. If it's not there, then we literally have to sequence the gene to find the second mutation. Then, of course, the, the Prader-Pillar syndrome, angel man, spinal cerebral tracheas, hemophilia, myotonic dystrophy, Wilson disease. So the beta thalassemia, we relied very early that to set up a prenatal diagnostic program, <coughs> you would have to find the mutation in our country. So we know there is enough data that we know all over India that which mutations are common in which part of India. So here is a lot of Gujarat and Punjab. And so there are five mutations which account for about 90% of the cases. So this, of course, has given us the basis of starting a prenatal diagnosis. We ourselves have carried out prenatal diagnosis of about 2,500. And now it's available in Delhi and Bellore and Chandigarh, Hyderabad and Mumbai. And uh, so we are, ourselves use two techniques to confirm whether disease is not there or there. And we do, of course, uh, uh, earlier we used to do this common mutation, the uncommon mutation. So now we just do the common one. If we don't find it, we just go and sequence the gene. Because it's a small gene, only 1200 kV. Albinism is a problem for us. See, it's not considered uh, too much of a burden here. But in our country, we found, we did a study of uh, examining birth defects, about 100,000. And we found 7 out of 94,000 births had albinism. So 1 in 3, so the gene frequency was 1 in 58. And this is very commonly so. And here, because this child with albinism stands out, and the eye problems are quite severe. They can't focus, the eyes keep moving. And so it is a burden. So the people that do want prenatal diagnosis. So in fact, of course, the, so the, there is a common mutation in the tyrosine gene, R278X, which is present in about 50%. And the rest we have to sequence. Fortunately, the gene is not very big, the tyrosine gene. But here was a case, we had some darker hair, he had some color, but still he was fairer, which has not come out in this picture so well. But then we have to really study the P gene, the OCA2 and the OCA3, and here we found a mutation the OCA3 gene. So here was another child, again there was some color in the hair, and uh, the here we found the defect in the P gene. So this is an important disease for us, Wilson disease. When I was at, I trained in clinical uh, pediatrics in England, and we had a very famous uh, physician who used to say, never miss a treatable disease. It's a criminal for a physician to miss a treatable disease. And Wilson disease is one. So I always teach my students, if a child with Wilson disease dies, it's a failure of medicine. 
But interestingly, at the molecular level, our mutations are quite different from the Caucasian mutations. So this common Caucasian mutation, as the Mandela six times, does not occur at all in India. So although Indians are Caucasians, so I know this needs study. Although we are considered more Caucasians, and we have cystic fibrosis and many of the disorders, and uh, some mutations are same, but here the mutations are quite different. So why it happened with this disease, I don't know. So how the molecule diagnosis has uh, expanded the utility of genetic counseling is illustrated by this case. So this uh, eight-year-old boy who has these full going incidental seizure in the class, generalized or brief on examination was completely normal except mightily brisk deep tendon reflexes. But the MRI again gave us a clue. So this was done the MRI and you found these white matter changes in the occipital area. And just told us that this adrenoleucodystrophy. So we confirmed it on doing the VLCFAs, which were uh, characteristic of uh, this one, and we did the gene study. Now the interesting thing, <coughs> they did actually matching for the family to try to find a, a match for a bone marrow transplant. And this is what we found. So when we did this, so they were doing my actually studies on these other siblings, and we found the sister, she was a carrier, the sister was also a carrier, and she had a son who had no symptoms, was completely healthy, but he also was positive for the mutation. So the issue was now, it was difficult to convince this family that there's something wrong with this boy, because well, he was perfectly normal. But when we did his MRI, we could still see very early changes, although he was asymptomatic. So here the ideal situation for him is to do a bone marrow transplant. But the availability of a matched uh, donor so that's a, the limiting factor. And in India, there is a cord blood storage is going on, but it's all on the private sector. So we do not have a public sort of system because we have 27 million births. If you just collected that cord, the stem cell, it would be an amazing resource. But somehow the money involved, perhaps, is holding back the government. So the number of private banks are there, cord blood banks. And some of them, we are able to get a very close match. Fortunately, the cord blood, you can do a little bit of mismatch and uh, the, the, the cord blood stem cell can get accepted. So the color was diagnosed as a disease before his symptoms and the bone marrow would have been curated. So the, as I mentioned earlier, pre the diagnosis is greatly in demand and we ourselves are, uh, uh, with the help of Perkin Hammer, uh, we have set up the bags on beads technology and the micro days are coming but we are not yet uh, available as a routine. And we are also working on the non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, which would be very useful. I think now I don't know how common it has become in Europe, in the US, because it's there now, the Down syndrome, you can do a non-invasive screening. So maybe some of these, uh, the uh, triple tests and all might go out of the fashion. But this is another important thing, because many of these families with this genetic disorder, they keep on having affected children. So they want something to bypass that, to go through the agony of a prenatal test and affected child and repeating this again the next one. So there is a demand for the pre-implantation. And I think we are working on this, but we haven't yet got, there is some pre-implantation diagnosis available, but only for chromosomal disorders, the aneuploidies, not for the single gene disorder. So we, of course, the molecular techniques using this. As I mentioned earlier, thalassemia is the largest, uh, and then all the other, intrauterine infection also is a problem. They will use the molecular technology to diagnose whether the fetus has the disease or not. So as I said, we are developing our own panel that we should screen every pregnant woman <coughs> and to reduce the burden of these disorders. Thalassemia, spinal muscular atrophy, fragile life, Duchenne, penetrated hyperplasia. So these we find some of the commoner mutations in our country. Country is full of new syndromes if we had the technology. But this one we were able to find that here was a child with spasticity and, and had the skin changes. And you know, once you find this, there's one disease you think of, these are skin changes, the ichthyosis, you think of the Sjogren Larsen syndrome. So we have been working with Bill Riso in the US, and uh, we sent him the skin fibroblast, and he found the change in the gene, and he demonstrated this. But here was a case, had a similar picture, had spasticity, extension, 
had the skin regions, had microcephaly, had changes in the brain, cortical atrophy, but the SFS, Jordan Larson syndrome, was excluded. So we had some family in the India, and there was one family in uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, the uh, exome sequencing was done for these two families. And uh, of course, uh, using a blind these filters, and including uh, these markers, so you will end up with three genes which could be involved. And then these were sequenced by Sanger sequencing. No mutations were found in this one, but in the second one, mutations were found, homozygous mutations. So this confirmed the new gene. So this, this gene had been involved in some eye disorders, the Stargard syndrome. But uh, this was the first time when it caused this disease also. So there's a body, there's a lot of interaction of these genes. So this uh, exome sequencing, I'm sure, in the years to come, is going to reveal a lot of new uh, genes and new interactions of the various genes. So in India, before we marry, we use this. <laughs> we match the horoscopes. <laughs> so whether in the future, so people have been saying that match the genes. And this was a prospective couple might to look at their DNA studies, get the markers on the computer and examine them. So I don't know whether this will be a good thing. Personally, I think it will be a bad day when we start matching this DNA before you marry. Because everyone is carrying these abnormal genes. So this is my last slide. Of course, we have the nucleotides. This is the genomic paradigm in all over the world. You have the nucleotides making genes. You have the genes making RNA. You have the RNA making protein. And you have the protein making money. <laughs> Same mutation. Same mutation. We found three mutations, homozygous, heterozygous case. Yes. But uh, I didn't know, I was not aware that there were all these other so mutations. So many others, yeah, this is what we were searching. And uh, I think this might be true for many ethnic groups in India. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs careful study. Because we, the, the ethnic groups, they don't marry consanguinously. In the Hindu religion, they said, six generations behind, you should not be related. But the community is the same. So they will marry within the community. A Sood will marry a Sood, although not directly related. And I said, the other one, they don't marry consanguinously. But you have this founder mutation. So I think it's a, it's a very uh, area, fertile area for research. I was wanting to know how you get the micro -res done for three hundred dollars. Do you have a company that works with you? Yeah, well, there are a, there are a number of companies, private companies, set up a micro -res. and uh, so we send it to them. We ourselves are in the process of establishing our own institute, and uh, so. Uh, but I find, see, in India, money is not short. To buy a micro -res system is very easy to establish, and there is money in the sense, each test is going to cost, uh, you know, so you can make, make money easily. So the private labs, like you have Quest and, uh, you know, LabCorp, the Quest is in India also. And I think they are also now thinking whether to start micro -rays. I know the biochemical man, Rajesh Sharma, who is their head, he has been worked with me for some time in India. And so they are now thinking of bringing TMS also, but TMS already exists in many laboratories. Micro arrays also their number of laboratories, and the technology is coming cheaper. So I think many of most of the big centers will start offering these micro arrays because the parents they have abnormal child, they want to know why it happened. Just do chromosome, you won't find anything. So, but here if you tell them, of course it brings its own problem. You have to study the parent. Did it come from one of the parents and all that? But still, it is some internal satisfaction that okay, it was not their fault. It's just the change in the DNA which occurred. 
Yes, you had a question. Well, you're, you, you mentioned how difficult it is for the Gateses of the world to actually understand that what they've done with infectious diseases, if they look at the next 20 years, they need to be setting up to do the genetic and the birth defects and the development of disability things. But now, just all being lumped in, the kids dying, or people yeah. not seeing them, and so on. How do you change that conversation? Are you having any luck changing yeah. that conversation? Okay, the, the change has occurred that the shift has already occurred in the non communicable diseases. The government is investing huge amounts. But the, what they include in non communicable disease is diabetes, hypertension, epilepsy, cancer. The, we have a plan called the National Rural Health Mission, which has a budget more than the Ministry of Health. Because the idea is to establish all these facilities and take them to the rural areas, which is a very nice, of course, it's good and it's working. So the minister said, let us, uh, and non communicable diseases are rising because of the food habits, you know, and not less exercise and eating more. So diabetes really, India is supposed to be a diabetic capital of the world. There's so many diabetes. So they, they said, they, he has sanctioned a plan, 100 districts are screening everyone for uh, blood sugars, for ECG, and to pick up this disease. So we even tried to ask them that, give some budget also to the birth defects, to the genetic disorders. And they have said, okay, fine, we, we will do it. But still, because I think the issue of treatability, See, the diabetes, you can treat in the sense, okay, you have insulin and you can reduce weight and you reduce your requirement. The United States still, the treatments are more complex. Special diets and all these things. And, uh, but the situation is changing. And it will be easy. I think if we pack, present is a package for a healthy newborn. So we can focus on the newborn. Screening can come by focusing the government is very keen for this healthy newborn. And uh, for example, this, uh, I know Simon uh, Godfrey is an old friend because of the folic acid fortification. So there is no, uh, in fact, there is a lot of interest in fortifying the food with folic acid to try to reduce the neural tube defects. And uh, so I think that things are changing. And uh, yes, please. So um, you mentioned a number of metabolism disorders that, you know, here at least, probably a good number of those would have been picked up on our newborn screening. And I was wondering, what is the status of newborn screening in, in India? OK, it's, a, it's not yet mandatory. Uh, it's not a, there's no, the government has no plan to start in everyone. Because I think their still focus is to uh, institutionalize all the deliveries. Because the maternal mortality is still high in India. So their focus is bring all women to deliver in some institution which will cut down the new and the maternal mortality. And there is a lot of focus on the new one. I think they are not that, I think we, as the United States, we have to do a lot of uh, campaigning to make them convince them that this is required and this is useful. I think the hypothyroidism, they would be very willing to accept because easy to treat and easy to test. And once it's set for hypothyroidism, then I think we can go on to the other diseases. I think we can, cannot jump straight away. So the expanded new one screen. So you so but you do screen for like PKU. I'm yes. Assuming. So PKU. So it's a PKU is less common in North India. See, like one in fifteen twenty thousand. So we ourselves in our hospital uh, we offer screening for three disorders: uh, hypothyroidism, uh, congenital latent hyperplasia, and G C P D deficiency. And the rest we sort of leave on to testing a symptomatic check. Because the PKU is uh, so low, one in twenty thousand. So, but I think if we offer, people will take it. But we are charging at a very subsidized rate from the parents. So all deliveries now are So maybe we should expand. That is our neonatologists have been saying, why don't you expand the range and uh, do PKU and galactosemia? Galactosemia is also one of the common ones. MSUD. Wow. I mean, especially with your rate of consanguinity. I mean, yes. it's sort of like a right opportunity. Yeah. But there is one catch. Dr. Sanvi was a very famous statistician. He said, consanguinity going over centuries reduces the incidence of genetic disorders. It's not as bad if you marry consanguinity over in one generation or two generations. Mm -hmm. Because the bad genes get weeded out. You get one affected child, you lose two genes. 
foresight to resolve it. So he put this theory, and he showed curves that going over hundred years is consensus marriage to a two thousand years. So you find that the frequency of the disorder comes less and less. So in fact, in practice, consanguinity does not appear to be harmful. The common man who is marrying consanguinity says, "Oh, my family are engineers and doctors, and you are saying consanguinity is harmful." Our people have been marrying consanguinity. But if you look at the genetic clinics, there the consanguinity is associated with the problems. But if you look at the public, you find a large number of consanguinous marriages no child affected child. Although it's a uh, the, in Arab countries, the really situation is bad because there, of course, they have many children, and uh, so they. they uh, but now, I think the Arab world also has got woken up to the fact, and they have in fact mandatory screening for genetic disease. So in uh, Dubai, the Abu Dhabi, uh, Saudi Arabia, they have a mandatory screening for genetic disease before marriage. Of course, they focus on before marriage because they are slowly changing that prenatal diagnosis should be allowed. But so far, many of the Muslim countries prenatal diagnosis is not allowed. But once you face a Pakistan has allowed pre the prenatal diagnosis. Dubai has allowed. Tunisia. There are a number of countries. Iran. See, Iran had such a huge problem. I don't know what percentage of the national budget was going into treating thalassemia. So they woke up and said, "Well, they say here thing we should control." So they started doing prenatal. I mean, pre counseling, the pre marriage counseling. But they found 50 percent. They are related to you. So that's what is a very interesting. Uh, so the the, the arranged marriages are still very high in India, right? Yes, I think uh, it's changing. It's uh, in the cities mostly of the people just sort of find their own mate and. Uh, but uh, the, the villages, I think, still not our arranged marriages go on. But you know what uh, Socrates said that uh, you find a good spouse, you'll be happy. And you found a bad one, you will become a philosopher. <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities for genetic counselors in India. Do you know of any um, training programs, or are they planning to develop? Okay, there are no training programs yet um, for genetic counselors. So I was talking to Madhuri and wonder that we should start one. I think because you, uh, watching what the genetic counselors are doing here, it's a tremendous job. And it uh, reduces the burden for the clinical geneticist. And so I think there is a need. The youngsters, the, you know, the MSc graduates, and, uh, they are very keen on genetics. Because see, the newspapers are full of these genetics, so they get excited. And so I think there will be, a, and a lot of them come to US to get their MSc in genetic counseling. They go to England for MSc in genetic counseling. So I think there, is, there will be a need, and there will be a good take. And they will, they will be useful. 